Next speaker uh, is Dr. Andrew Kralicek from Plant and Food. Um, I think he's going to be talking to us about smells. Um, thanks, Roger. Um, so today I want to introduce you to a new NSC-funded program. Um, I like to look at it as a little project with huge aspirations. Um, essentially, our crazy idea is to develop a new type of sensor that can be, it should be, it's robust, durable, that can be left out in the field for months to detect mammal pests, and the way it's going to do that is by smelling them. Um, so why is this important? Okay. Well, um, I think as Campbell Leckie um, talked about a little bit earlier, um, eradication, an eradication program is not the end of the story. Um, essentially, you, how can we determine um, if a pest has been fully eradicated in a target area and there may not be maybe small pockets of them or individuals left? And how, maybe six months after an eradication program, how can we quickly determine if um, re-invasion re is, is a possibility? Because the challenge that um, uh, managers of these areas face is that pest detection at extraordinary low density is very hard to do. So um, current approaches are not routine enough or cost effective enough to facilitate that. So I've got some examples there. I'll just, uh, so this one here, um, it's a kill trap. Um, it requires somebody to go out into the bush um, and put some bait in there and then go out later and check that um, whether um, an animal has been killed in it. Um, the one here is a wax tag, and again, that requires somebody to go out and put it out there and then come back later and check to see if there are any teeth marks which can identify what kind of pest has been um, chewing on it. We have um, a tracking tunnel here where somebody will have to put down some, um, uh, something on the inside of that so you can look at um, the shape of the footprints of the animal which is going through it. So these are all incredibly labour intensive and there just isn't the money um, to make routine daily monitoring of these um, feasible. I should say there are moves here to start um, using wireless communication to, to monitor that, so that's a, a major step forward. The other approach is um, to use trail cameras to see if you can identify that, and that's something which is very exciting. But again, um, the cost of these um, cameras um, is still too high to enable um, a deployment over widespread areas, and indeed sometimes these cameras actually break down. And the final thing, which is really the gold standard for sniffer technologies, which is your, your detector dog. This is a, a detector dog um, used by DOC. Um, they cost tens of thousands of dollars to maintain and, um, and actually train. And again, it's not practical to put them out in the wild every day with um, a handler to cover large areas of, um, of the bush. So, oop, next slide. Um, so our big idea is sensors that can sniff out pests. And what we're doing here is, a, uh, is taking advantage of what all animals do, um, including ourselves. Um, we all, they, they, they produce smells. And um, there are certain kind of smells known as semiochemicals. These are signaling molecules, um, which, um, which animals produce, such as sex pheromones, to attract um, their mates. They also put out um, smells to mark their territory. Um, and um, they're also present in urine and in droppings as well. So I've got an example there of the possum. It has scent glands. It has um, this red-brown gland here, which produces a musky sweet smell. There's a gland in the pouch, and there's a gland in the bottom, which apparently produces um, a, a smell like onion. So I haven't confirmed that, um, so, and I don't want to. Um, so um, what we're wanting to do is see if we can find some unique compounds which are species specific, okay? So this is the way that we're proposing to do it and the project has started already. Um, I'm working with Wayne Linklater and Rob Keyses from the Victoria University of Wellington and they're helping um, to identify pest volatile organic compounds and what they're doing is they've got access to, to possum and rat colonies and they're looking at um, the bedding from those colonies and those, that bedding contains the scents the fur, dried urine, dried droppings, etc., in that bedding. They're also looking at fresh urine from these animals. And what they're doing is um, essentially absorbing um, the volatiles that come off 
those materials and using uh, solid phase micro extraction approaches, which, which uses a, like a spemi fibre to absorb it. We're then putting that into a gas chromatograph where um, the volatiles deabsorb and they can be run down a, a column um, to enable the separation of those compounds. And then you can do mass spectrometry on individual peaks in the gas chromatography run to identify what those compounds are. And what we're looking at, looking for are compounds that are unique to that species and hopefully prevalent in reasonable quantities to make it easy to detect when an animal will pass over the sensor or maybe urinate on the sensor out in the wild. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's a difficult proposition. Um, we're still yet to, according to my information, still yet to um, identify sex pheromones for possums. Um, I think James was alluding to me that um, someone has discovered the um, pheromones for rat, um, but I need to talk to this person. So ideally that would be a, a great thing to look at, but maybe it's going to be something which is, um, serves no purpose for the animal, but is present in reasonable quantities in the urine and is species specific. I don't care, I just want something which is, um, which is present and detectable. So I'm currently going for a few lists of compounds that Wayne and Rob have sent me, and they've promised to send me a little bit, um, a few more, um, and we'll make some decisions on which compounds we're going to work with. And the idea is to take a panel of these compounds. And the next step is to prepare receptors specific for these, or these volatile organic compounds. Um, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to talk about how um, my team is going to do that. Um, my IP manager has threatened to kill me if I spill the beans on this stuff. But sa safe to say what we're trying to do is produce receptors um, that are selective for the compounds, very sensitive for the compounds, and will be stable when, when deployed in sensors for months in the field. And then the third part of the project, which is really occurring in the, th um, in the third year, the final year of the project, is to develop a sensor device that can be deployable um, in, the in the wild, basically. And I'm working with two groups of people. Um, you drank a Travis Sedgic from the University of Auckland and Justin Hodgkiss from the Victoria University of Wellington, who are some of New Zealand's leading experts in sensor development. And I'm also working with Keith Sherrick and John Hyun Choi from Plant and Food Research, who have a history of developing um, cheap sensors to detect volatiles. So these guys have been involved in developing sensors for detecting um, changes in the aroma of fruit uh, during a, the, over the supply chain, so you can monitor fruit quality as it's being transported over. Um, Keith was behind uh, the technology known as RipeSense. So they're going to help us with um, working out how to detect directly from the air. And so basically the sensor itself is comprised of, oops, sorry guys, get back. The sensor itself is, comprises our receptor. It's coupled to some kind of sensor surface. And um, when the ligand interacts, or sorry, when the volatile compound interacts with the receptor, you will get a change of signal in the transducer. So this may be an electrical change, or it may indeed be an optical, a change in the optical signal. So we're going to be exploring these kind of approaches. The signal will be produced, it will be amplified and then taken to a processor where it will be converted into a digital form for transmission. And so this is what we're hoping to get within three years. That's a prototype little device that can be deployed. But how are we going to deploy it? So this is where my other collaborator, uh, Bruce Warburton, comes in. So many of you probably are familiar with Bruce. He's done a lot of work um, looking at mammal pest um, eradication and, and looking at the populations in the field. And he's been interacting with a guy called Simon Croft from Encounter Solutions, which we heard a little bit um, earlier in this session. And I talked to Simon last week, and Simon's got this amazing um, wireless network currently being uh, tested in the Cape to City uh, project. And um, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, so he's basically got... Um, uh, wireless nodes which he can put in the field and these can be connected to hub sites which then beam the signal, whatever it's coming from them, to a satellite or to a cellular network um, and then that can beam, be beamed to a server and then you can look at it using um, a smart device, your smartphone for example, to monitor potentially traps. So that's what they're doing at the moment is testing this, um, this wireless network 
using pest traps, but obviously they've got other ideas of other things they can actually link up with. And what we want to do is jump on the bandwagon and add sensors to that, okay? And just to give you an idea how that might look, this is, um, this is some work that they've done, and uh, hold on, let me get that, yep. Um, so here's the hub station, that's what the hub station looks like. I think it costs about $4,000 um, to make that or to, uh, to buy it. Um, and out in the field, all dotted along here, are these nodes. And these nodes are the size of a cigarette packet, so they're very tiny. Currently cost about $100. And what I would like to see is that our sensors can initially be incorporated with one of these nodes and just see if we can get it to work out there in the field, just do a case study. But what I really want to see if that happens is the next phase is to actually convert these into their own mini hub, okay? And dot numbers of them around each node, okay? So the dream is um, a sensor which is very cheap, you know, probably it could be the size of a coin, okay? Um, and it can just be distributed out there in the wild put in potential nesting sites or um, in areas of the forest where you know there's a good chance that um, a possum or a rat is going to go running through that. Could be put into those tracking tunnels, for example. And um, what we want to be able to see is that, yes, it works. So the idea is it's, it's a, essentially an early warning system. Um, if you've cleared an area and you, if this goes off, then that will tell you, hey, there's a pest, pest has returned. So let's go into that zone, because no, it's not showing anywhere else, and let's target that for eradication. Let's hit it hard before it has a chance to, um, to get out of control. And so this is um, my almost last slide. So the goal is a cheap biosensor for mammal pest detection uh, to detect species-specific biomarker chemicals um, and to allow remote monitoring in the field for, for months. And the hope is that if we can achieve this, the impact will be to confirm pest eradication with confidence, early detection of reinvasion, and targeted eradication to mitigate new incursions. And I just want to thank uh, the National Science Challenge for the opportunity to have a go at this project. I also want to thank all the collaborators I've um, I introduce you to during the talk from PFR, from the University of Auckland, from Victoria University of Wellington, and from Landcare. Um, I didn't have enough money to pay them for their time, so um, they're doing this out in the spirit of science, and I guess also for the love of this country, so I really appreciate that. Um, it's a bit of a high-risk project, but um, my, my philosophy, if you don't do it, if you don't try, you don't get. So um, finally, on that, on that note, I just want to say I need your help, um, because Hopefully, in about a week's time, I will get permission to put an advert out for a PhD student. There's a postdoc also funded in this project, and to work for me and your drank at Travis at the University of Auckland. And I don't know who you are, but you might know somebody who is interested in doing this kind of work. Um, so I want somebody who's got a strong background in molecular biology and is keen to be involved in state-of-the-art biosensor development. There's my email address. Um, write it down. and. Tell that person to email me, okay? Or come up to me after this talk and tell me who you, who you think might be a good person to, to do this. Um, because as many of us probably know who are in science, it can take a while to actually get a PhD student on board, um, not only with paperwork. So I'll just leave it there, thank you. I'm wondering how far away can your collaborator Keith detect a kiwi fruit, and how relevant is that? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? How far away, at what distance, can the sensors that have been developed for fruit detect them, and how relevant is that, do you think, to your mammal work? I'm, 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 I'm asking a question about what's going to be the range of these sensors, you think, in the outdoors. Okay, so I'll be honest with you, the range is probably going to be very close at this stage, right? So. Um, if you're wanting to detect a kiwi fruit, uh, sorry, kiwi fruit, what am I saying? Kiwi, <laughs> um, it's going to have to be very close. I mean, we're envisaging a mammal coming along in this scenario and, and urinating on our, on our sensor, okay? Right, or brushing against it 
may be and leaving um, some kind of a smell on there. The fruit sensors that I discussed that Keith's doing, often these are actually on the fruit itself or they're incorporated into the packaging that the fruit is, um, is being sent in. Okay? So, I mean, that's longer down the distance, uh, longer into the future, it could be potential, but we're starting small, you know, close proximity uh, detection. Thank you. Thanks.